Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon from London. Uh, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, I'm using two devices, but I think uh, colleagues at ICMC have pinged me or spotlighted me, as they say, so that should be okay. Uh, well, good um, afternoon to everyone who's joined us. Um, I think we will make a start now. We have an hour for the session today, so we'll make a start. So this is really just a warm welcome to this um, event in conversation with Onikachi Wambu, which will be looking at the newly published book, Empire Windrush Reflections on 75 Years and More of the Black British Experience. So um, I will start, so just to give you a quick overview of the program today, I will uh, be your uh, be the moderator for today. My name is Stella Opoko Usu. I am the executive director at Afford, which is the African Foundation for Development here in the UK, focusing on diaspora contributions to development in Africa. Um, we will have, uh, I'll do a short introduction for um, Onikachi, who will be speaking shortly. And then Onikachi will be reading an excerpt from the book. Um, and then we will have a bit of a Q&A between the two of us, uh, a short one, and then we will open up to questions from everyone else, uh, which Onikachi will respond to, and then we will close. And we're hoping to do all of this within an hour, uh, but most importantly, it, hopefully it will be engaging, um, and you know, hopefully everyone will take something away from this as well. So just very uh, quickly by way of introduction, uh, Onikachi Wambu is an associate special projects at Afford, having just stepped down as executive director just about two weeks ago. Um, he's been a pioneer and innovator in the field of policy and practice of diaspora development. Um, Afford, of, um, Afford advocacy work under his leadership has contributed to UK and international recognition of the role of the diaspora in African and international development. Since 1990, Onikachi has taken a leadership role on the issues of African cultural heritage, especially focusing on the impact of slavery and colonialism by making high level presentations and recommendations to the UN and African Union on the issue. Uh, he currently uh, coordinates Afford's Return of the Icons program for the restitution of human remains and African artifacts. Uh, he's also a former newspaper uh, editor and television producer for, for the BBC and PBS. Um, and in his latest book, the anthology Empire um, Windrush, Reflections on 75 Years and More of the Black British Experience, this was published on the 22nd of June this year. So just a quick introduction to the book. Um, this is a groundbreaking, groundbreaking anthology, um, Empire Windrush. Uh, reflections of 75 years and Onikachi has brought together some of the best and most significant writing about the arrival of Empire Windrush. Uh, it features a preface uh, by Margaret Busby and some new um, um, some new writing also from Bernadine uh, Abristo, Mike Phillips and Dan Hicks and it's a unique journey through the British past, present and future via the prism of the black imagination. Um, I have to say, though, just that for me, in terms of reading the book, I found it absolutely fascinating um, in terms of how it really articulates and talks about the broader connections between the different experiences of migration globally. It takes us right back to the 15th century, the very beginning of slave trade, uh, but also through the framework, which Nukachi will talk about a little bit more, um, and through his introduction as well, uh, it expertly demonstrates through the writings of those who've gone before us. So you have writings from uh, Olaudo Equieno, Mary Prince, CLR James, Jan Carew, just to name a few. But it really talks about this connection uh, between the, you know, between the continents, if you like. So going from Africa to the Caribbean to South America and so on. And um, I, I've learned quite a lot just by reading this book. Um, there were things that I thought I knew and uh, that I felt quite sort of challenged by um, um, uh, as well. But without much ado, I'm just going to turn over to Onikachi now, who will do a reading of an excerpt from his introduction in the book, which spells out the framework. 
and the visioning much better than I could ever do. And then we'll have a short Q&A, as I had mentioned, uh, and then we will basically get things rolling. So, uh, Onikachi, I'm going to pass on to you now uh, for, the, for the short reading. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Um, and um, also thank you um, to ICMC for um, and the steering and the civil society, GFMD civil society steering committee for facilitating the conversation. It's a, I think it's a really important um, conversation to, to look at migration in the whole and the way that this has um, impacted uh, all of us. Um, the book is a response to the post-war migration to the UK. Um, many of us have begun talking about the Empire Windrush as the moment that that mass migration from the colonies to the UK um, began uh, with this ship that brought over 600 ex-servicemen who had served in the war in the UK back to the UK, um, um, in Europe in the Second World War. And it brought them back from the Caribbean to the UK um, where there were labor needs and, and Britain was looking to rebuild after the war and uh, opened up its doors for, for this migration to take place. And since then, their presence and others who have followed have transformed the UK to the extent that we now have a um, prime minister of uh, Indian descent via Africa. And also our first minister in Scotland is somebody of Pakistani descent. So you can see the extent of this transformation that has happened since 1948. Um, the section I'm going to read is from is the last bit from the introduction, which is from Windrush 50 to Windrush 75, because the context um, to the book, um, this, uh, this latest edition was an earlier one that I did in 1982, which looks at 50 years of the arrival of the ship. So the first anthology in 1998 um, charted the emotional journey of familiar strangers back to the seat of empire in prose, poetry, fiction, essays, and interviews, the volume focused on the response of the brilliant group of Caribbean, Asian, and African writers to the changing landscape of post-war Britain. And that first generation of light writers, including C.L.R. James, V.S. Naipaul, John Lamin, George Lamin, Samuel, Samuel Selvon, Stuart Hall, uh, gave way to a next generation of writers that include Simon Rushdie, Carl Phillips, Ben Okri, Benedin Evaristo, uh, and Hanif Qureshi. Uh, and this generation found its voice so powerfully in the 80s and 90s. White commentators in that edition, such as Colin McInnes, uh, Devla Murphy, and Elizabeth Taylor, also combined in tackling the themes of arrival, settlement, and struggles against racism and exclusion. Um, amidst learning to move beyond ambivalence sometimes to truly reconciling and achieving a deeper love for their new home. The collection celebrated the writer's gifts for challenging orthodoxy. They contextualized the post-colonial experience and often offered imaginative solutions for transcending the limitations of the past in order to find a way through history. At a time of growing interest in Black British writing, a wave of critical responses um, and expanded ac academic discourse on the impact of Black British writing followed the publication of that first anthology. Um, the increased interest and detailed reassessment um, has, has have been prompted by an explosion of literary output by a new generation of um, authors of Caribbean, African, and her Asian heritage essentially the former empire coming home. Uh, their com contributions have garnered immense recognition and the highest literary awards with V.S. Naipaul and Gurner winning Nobel Prizes in 2001 and 2021 respectively. And they won, all the writers have won all the major literary awards in the UK, including Booker, Orange Prizes, Poetry Medals, etc. A comprehensive and authoritative second edition uh, volume could now easily select from over 80 writers from a third and fourth generation who are producing fiction, poetry, memoirs, and autobiographies, essays, travel writing, and journalism. 
uh, that have achieved critical or commercial success. However, this post-1998 output has coincided with a period when the UK was undergoing a number of earth-shaking convulsions, uh, beginning with 911, post-colonial wars and defeat in the greater Middle East, a financial crash in 2008, the Brexit referendum in 2016, which resulted in the UK leaving the European Union in January 2020, after 47 years of membership, the COVID pandemic in 2020, which paused daily life, and then the Ukraine war in 2022, a human tragedy and a challenge to the Western dominated global order. Each of these seismic events has led to a profound questioning of British identity and place in the world, including a further factoring of the United Kingdom itself, this, despite increased devolution. We've also seen anti-terrorism and hostile immigration panics, which underlined uh, a scandal in the UK in 2018 called the Windrush scandal, when um, citizen uh, residents and people who had been resident in the UK for over 40 years were deported back to their supposed countries of origin. Um, and the retreat from the EU and the Black Lives Matter protests uh, as statues topics have provoked a reckoning with slavery, empire, and colonization, and indeed Britain's place in the world. So this edition, Empire Windrush, Reflections of 75 Years and More of the Black British Experience, finds us at this point of inflection in the future fortunes of the UK. It's during the temptation to produce a comprehensive volume focusing on the new wave of African, Caribbean, and Asian writers. This collection instead is divided into four substantive sections. Reclaiming history, section one, fighting empires, writing freedom, section two, the Windrush moment, section three, and then falling statues, rising myths. Essentially locates the current Windrush experience between recovering and reimagining a black British past, which is more expansive than is usually projected, and the need for dreaming of new possibilities for the future. A sample of 20 writers comprising some of the best known of the last 75 years, and others such as Olave Aquino, reintroduced again from history, um, have been enlisted as our guides in accompanying us over the unfolding pages and dramatic centuries of the Black British presence in the UK. Phyllis Wheatley, Olada Aquino, Mary Prince, and Bernardina Viverista opened the anthology in the Reclaiming History section, providing testimonials of an expanded and reimagined Black British path, both in its length and its breadth. Collectively, their writing extends from reflections on the Roman period to a time when the empire still included the North American colonies and writers moved back and forth, retreating the empire as a single political, economic and intellectual space. Their contributions document the first painful encounters of enslaved Africans with the empire, the, the processing of their forced absorption into the cultural and mercantilist orbit, um, into its cultural and mercantilist orbit and their literary attempts at writing freedom. Bernardino Veristo escapes altogether to an earlier period in Roman London and to an earlier empire uh, and a time unencumbered by racial dogmas. Under the section Fighting Empires, Writing Freedom, CLR James, Jan Yan Karu and Salman Rushdie set up magisterial accounts of the world we currently inhabit and how we got here over the last 500 years. The James and Carew essays describe the Caribbean setting created by the European empires following the opening of Christopher Columbus. They discuss the new products and production techniques which create a new kind of world economy, in many ways the most modern. The conditions are intolerable and produce unique men and women who seek to overturn the unendurable order launching innumerable revolts and a series of successful revolutions that still define the world. Um, the essays also focus on the role of intellectuals and especially writers and their texts as important elements of the liberatory efforts. They analyze the internalization and global spread of these ideas and texts and their praxis in so many struggles in the United States and Africa. 
in spite of the oppression and mon marginalization expressed by the dispossessed of the Americas, there have been as much co-creators of that Atlantic space, its economy, its arts and culture, indeed its values. It was in their struggles to make their unfreedom that freedom itself was defined, their bodies literally being the anvil on which the Western ideal of freedom was tested and beaten out and transforming these ideals into functional everyday human values. In the same section, Simon Rusty considers the idea of a, the expanding frontier in the evolutionary history of the United States as it has escaped the shadow of its former colonial master, which many have argued it now dominates and integrates as Orwell, Orwell's fabled Estrip One. Rushdie argues that models of the frontier concept have also influenced Americans' own external expansion and its self-image as the global policeman of that Western liberal order unleashed by Columbus. For instance, one only has to recall the dead or alive slogans of uh, the putative global sheriff, George Bush Jr., during the hunt for Osama bin Laden and Sad Salman, Saddam Hussein to catch a flavor of the Wild West unfolding worldwide, with the frontiers now extended uh, to um, a the Middle East and Asia. As the inheritance Inheritor of the leadership of the Atlantic order unleashed by Columbus, the US has overseen a globalized world of unprecedented migratory movements with serious implications for the fast moving exchange and clash of cultures and ideas, the consequences of which Rushdie himself has grievously suffered, ironically being severely confined at a time others are speed speedily on the move and enduring a wounded attack in August 2022 intended to silence him. Although we continue to live under the global dominance of the Atlantic order, the literally shrinking space for Western ideas represented by the Rushdie experience portend challenges to that Atlantic order supremacy, especially from reawakened centers of power, particularly in Eurasia. In September 2002, India's gross domestic product overtook that of the UK, replacing it as the fifth largest economy in the world. This is the second UK ex-colony that, that has overtaken the former empire. We continue to live in the geopolitical shadow of the first um, when the US overtook, while awaiting what the second portends. Perhaps the election of a prime minister of Indian heritage is the first profound sign of the change in balance in the relationship. Meanwhile, in the Windrush moment uh, section, extracts from George Lamin, Stuart Hall, Samuel Selvon, Andrea Levy, V.S. Paul, Mike Phillips, John Agard, Grace Nichols chronicle the people whose lives are silly, severely upended by these massive global forces. They try to make sense of their lives in a rapidly changing and sometimes disintegrating world. Escaping, they move continents, seeking opportunities, reinvention, and the safety of a home, in inverted commas. They embrace the beautiful optimism of the broken, poetically. Leonard Cohen breaks it down in his song Anthem. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. The pieces thus capture the disorientation, the alienation, the questioning, the fluidity of identities that these individuals confront without sentimentality. Beyond that, there's also celebration of the legacy of a fine line of writers and their role amidst the temptatious seas in bringing the ship home to a safer harbor. In the final section, falling statues, rising myths, Dirin Adebayo, Dan Hicks, Zadie Smith, Chantel, a new writer, Chantel Desert and Ben Ocri, are future focus, exploring through essays and speculative fiction, different ideas of transcendence, settling the debts of the past and illuminating pathways to the future, while drawing on that long memory resilience of those Bob Marley called the black survivors. The aim in the end is to travel through the last 2000 years in the imagination of these writers, pause in the Windrush present, 
before traveling forward again to the future. The echoes of the reflections and commentaries of the writers animating principles of each age and offering a coherence and continuity of experience and understanding. Wonderful, Onikachi, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, that pretty much, I mean, it's, of course it's an introduction, but it really lays out like the journey of the book and the collection of the writers, uh, the framing also of this. Um, where I want to start um, is really um, to ask you, because you do also in the introduction, you do talk about identities, the, the, the fluidity of identities, as you call it. Um, and that's where I wanted to start a question around this. So for me, I found uh, the intricacies um, of the West Indian connection and concepts of Africa and how this links to global um, Africans. I found all of that particularly fascinating. Uh, and even more so in Jan Carew's, um, um, in his, his narrative, uh, he talks about the um, uh, ethnocide of the native people in South America at the very beginning of the slave trade, beginning with Columbus, and how this then impacts on migration as it unfolds uh, over five centuries. And then you also have CLR um, James, who also talks about the positioning, even the geopolitical positioning of the West Indies and questions of national identity, which seem to be so critical in offering a better understanding of migration patterns and the connection with, um, with a continent. Um, can you, I suppose, as best as you can, unpack for us this notion of identity that just seems to be at the center of what you have described as the African transatlantic space? Thank you. Yeah, I started talking about that African Atlantic space in the same way that I think the conversation over the last 500 years has been dominated by the Euro-Atlantic Euro space um, and the impact that a number of middle, small middle income countries um, opened, went south around the Cape and opened up to the east. Um, through their journeys and then opened up to the West. And a result of these three movements, East, South to Africa, and then also to the West, um, became superpowers uh, and then reconfigured the modern world, which we've been in many ways living over the last 500 years. And, and the Empire Windrush is um, a moment in the unfolding of that drama of the Atlantic space. Um, now, my argument is that, um, and the reasons I'm interested in the African Atlantic space is that, you know, Africans have been co-creators of that space, as, as I said in the introduction. Um, the space was essentially, I suppose, a number of different ethnicities have have made it. I mean, the the, the Native Americans um, who, were, who were there, they've been very important creators of that space, both in their resistance and in the legacy that they've left us with in terms of language, in terms of culture. Um, and the, you know, the idea of the land of the brave is essentially uh, a Native American concept. So these three um, civilizations, I would say the African, the European and the Native American have been very important in shaping that space. Um, and I think it's time to consider what was unleashed by that space and the roles that each of those um, have also played. Obviously, others have been involved in that. The Chinese built the railways in the US, the um, um, Indians and others came into the Caribbean as indentured laborers. So it's it's been a huge, um, I would say global um, construction and we need to um, deconstruct it understand the forces played um, uh, by by each of those different um, e ethnicities and the way that in the process of the uh, confrontation and the, the people's identities have changed and have evolved and so you, you do now have a, an African American uh, sorry an African America I'm, I'm not going to say American specifically but across the Americas identity that has evolved. There's also in that 
uh, moment. And then obviously um, the Europeans have changed as well. Um, I remember as a filmmaker make, making a program once where I had some um, a, a Malian, a very famous Malian singer, and we'd recorded him in, in Bamako and we were editing the, his music into the documentary in Boston. Uh, and he was such a, an amazing singer that as we were in there, everybody in the, all, all the engineers in the um, editing um, studio, there were a lot of other programs being edited at the time, but my editor cranked up the volume and all the engineers heard this music and came in to listen because it was so amazing. Um, the, his name was Kastamadi, unfortunately he's passed now, but probably one of the best tenors in the world. Uh, and as they listened to this Malian music, um, one of them made a comment at the end. He said, oh, it sounds so familiar. Uh, and I had to remind him that he was African, given the African presence in America. And that's why it was so familiar to him, that he already knew this music through the blues, through everything else. So we need to discuss the, that contribution in a real sense. Uh, and that helps us to stop talking about the the current migratory movements as those there are people who have had done had no role in building these uh, new spaces in the west uh, as though they're assailing these spaces and and as though for the first time and and there is no prior history and there's no prior contribution that they've made in shaping these spaces and and these spaces have purely been constructed by Euro-Americans. So it's a it's an interesting moment um, in looking at that broader um, engagement, um, historical as well, and, and then looking at how all our identities have changed as a result. Uh, so that, you know, the white engineer who kind of didn't realize he was partially African can <laughs> rethink why he's partially African and, yeah. and, and embrace that um, uh, as part of his own liberation. No, absolutely. Thank you very much, Anikachi, for helping us connect as well, just connecting the dots, connecting the regions as well, which is uh, essentially what this, I suppose, this conversation is about as well, just helping everyone to really begin to see this. Um, I see that someone had put their hand up. We will come to questions shortly. I have one more question for Anikachi and then we will open it up. Uh, this one might be just a little bit longer, but do bear with me. So this is about the parallels, I suppose, that um, I, I, I see in the book, really, in terms of some of the stories that are shared, in terms of people's lives. Um, and I think this is more of a profound question around migration management. Um, some obvious parallels, and I call them obvious now, but not so much before, because it took a book basically to open my eyes to some of this as well. So um, I think one of them, uh, which I wanted to mention, is the um, is the story with Mary Prince, where there's a, a history, uh, the history of Mary Prince, a West Indian slave, um, and I mean for me that's part of the book and just reading her story it wasn't just upsetting but it's also quite um harrowing you know and um and this is a real story you know it's not it's not uh it's not a makeup story I mean this is somebody's real life and in her accounts during her time in England she talks about the perception of slaves that some people in quotes say that slaves do not want to be free and then she goes on to say and I'll quote this bit here she says, uh, I say, not so. How can slaves be happy when they have the halter around their neck and the whip around their back and are disgraced and thought no more and thought no more of than beasts and are separated from their husbands and mothers and children and sisters just as cattle are sold and separated. And as I read this, I suddenly stopped and I thought, but this is what happens in current migration patterns and with policies around you know, detention and separating families. Um, and this was happening in 1500. Um, and so I, I was then beginning to see this sort of parallel between some of the 
the, the stories in the book, some of the collections and what is happening in today's, in today's migration. But also just taking that a little bit further on as well. Um, I suppose in terms of the UK in relation to Windrush in the UK, the UK itself has seized, you know, this moment in terms of our own sort of national, uh, you know, the conversation. So you have Windrush Day, you have the stamps, you have the monument at Waterloo Station and so, um, and so on. Um, and all of this has been, I, I suppose in some ways you could say in spite of or because of a, a recent, um, you know, an environment policy, which was described as a hostile environment policy, which brought about the scandal as well. How has this progress taken place, if I can call it that? And how do we all basically learn from this, you know, as migrants, as diaspora, the wider society? What has been so unique about this space in terms of migration management? Yeah, th thanks for that question. It was a long, compli complex question, but I'll try and answer it the best that I can. I mean, Mary Prince was in the 1820s and 1830s, so it was a considerably after the, the movement had started. And in the UK, in the interregnum between the abolition of the trade in 1807 and the ab abolition of the institution of slavery on the plantations of the uh, of the in the uh, of the West Indies and the Caribbean and elsewhere. So she's in that status. The trade has been abolished. She comes to the UK um, as a slave, as an enslaved person. So she's still as enslaved because the institution is not abolished until 1833. And her status is not properly defined. So her the people that she accompanies, her owners in the, in the people who enslaved her in the Caribbean bring her along. Um, to look after them while they're in the UK. And when she arrives in the UK, she wants to fight for her, her, her liberty. And the book is really her making the case through legal challenges um, to argue that she can't be enslaved in Europe. So the Europe has always had this strange notion where within Europe, you know, the rights exist, but elsewhere, um, you know, slave, even territories dominated by the European powers, slavery was a, perfectly acceptable. Um, and so her fight is quite interesting, um, just looking at the different status uh, that we occupy. And of course, you you look at the, the, the resonance, as you say, even today, where people can live in the UK for 40 years and then um, in all purposes, uh, to all purposes, be considered uh, citizens and yet be deported back to the um, Caribbean because they're as part of a hostile environment pol policy. So there's this this um, this issue of uh, of your status always being on the question is 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 powerful um, 100, 150 years so uh, or 75 years afterwards. So Mary Prince is important for that. Of course, her experiences as an enslaved person, she documents accurately. And what is really important is that we should never lose sight of what is at the heart of this, the enslavement of others is um, the use of free labor, which is what um, she represents. And the re resonances today is that people are wanting to move around, um, move around the, the world. Um, as part of a, a movement of, of labor. And so you now see at, a, at one point, Africans were integrated into the labor markets of the world through enslavement. Today, there's still a problem about how you integrate African labor. Um, everything else, I've spoken about this in the past, everything else can move, capital can move, goods and services can move freely in international trade, but labor can't, which is a factor of production. And so in the dysfunction of labor not being able to move, you, you then get uh, Africa trying to export uh, something that enjoys a comparative advantage in, which is labor costs um, through dysfunctional means, which is people moving across the Sahara and uh, trying to get on these boats um, to, to cross and paying huge amounts of, of money so that they can um, make it to the to Europe and to employment opportunities. Um, so that that discourse is still there, um, and it's a circular one. It 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 the book, you know, the the people who came over on the Windrush, they came 
you know, because of the labor needs, the post-war labor needs in the UK. So this factor of labor, we, as people dealing with migration, we have to start talking about seriously and the way that it impacts everything else. Um, Britain, once people are over, they, they discover that they don't have the same rights, as I said about uh, Mary Prince. And so there's another battle for how you, you win these rights. And yes, we, we, we have to praise the UK for the steps that it's taken in terms of uh, integration, in terms of the recognition of the, the Windrush um, moment. Um, so as you said, you know, they've created a Windrush day, which is now celebrated on 22nd of June when the ship arrived. Um, they um, created a monument at Waterloo Station, the train station where most of a lot of the migrants arrived um, from their ships. And then also there have been stamps, national stamps commemorating the moment and even services and all the politicians have said wonderful things as part of their, that integration journey. But one of the things I wanted to just point out, like Mary Prince, this was not given. Um, Frederick Douglass, there's an epigraph in the in the book from Frederick Douglass um, um, in response to a, a, a speech he made on the West Indian um, struggles for independence, where he says, you know, power concedes nothing without a demand. So it has been the struggles of um, Windrush generation and their descendants and those of us who came from Africa and Asia as well for for these rights that has resulted in the space that we've created for these national commemorations and acknowledgements, but also in terms of um, the the space that we've created for being able to organize independently express our agency independently the space that we've created um, for um, for positive integration against uh, for uh, race relations legislation and anti-discrimination legislation. Um, these have been really important victories. Um, and I'll give you an example of how important they have been. Part of that post Windrush generation in 59, there was a young man who came in and there were uh, race riots um, um, and other, you know, there were tensions between the new arrivals and the existing population. And in, during those moments of tension, a young man, Kelso Cochrane, was murdered um, in 1959, and, and nobody was ever charged for his murder. And then you fast forward another 40 um, or so years, and uh, another young man is murdered in a racist attack, Stephen Lawrence. And again, a huge campaign 40 years later happens. And in the end, the government is forced to undertake a, um, a uh, an inquiry uh, and set up the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. And at the end of that, you know, the police are identified as institutionally racist and a number of other institutions are identified as institutionally racist. And a real attempt is made by government following the recommendations of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry to deal with this issue of inequity in, in institutions and, and how you begin to tackle that. And of course, in 2020, the Black Lives Matters movement and, and response has also accelerated those efforts. So um, to go back to Frederick Douglass, constant struggle, you know, as, as he said, power concedes nothing without a demand. Anikachi, thank you so much for that um, and for uh, yeah for for responding to my rather very long question. Uh, thank you. So um, at this point, I don't want to take up any more time because I think people would like to ask some questions. Uh, I did see uh, someone's hand up earlier on. I think I'm going through the list. I think it was Raj. Uh, Raj Badril. So I don't know if you want to, if you want to ask your question now, please unmute yourself um, and do and do ask your question. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I'm sorry, I'm very bad with names. Anyway, the book, yeah, it's very interesting. Oh, Onki Kachi. Yeah, very, and I'm tempted to buy the book, but that's uh, not the part of the question. My part of the question is, I mean, it's interesting and, you know, 
I, I lived in the UK as a student in the mid seventies. Uh, Enoch Powell in 1971 had passed this immigration, new immigration bill, you know, totally against people who were not whites and so on. So if one looks at that era, 1970, or early 1970, and now where you have uh, the prime minister of the United Kingdom of Indian descent. How do we explain that? Are we saying that England has become more tolerable, tolerant, or that they had somebody who can push their agenda of anti-immigration, right? Because he's now used as a sacrificial land. You make sure we don't have, and his policies suggest that he's going to really crack down. on. So, so my question is, is England becoming more tolerant towards, you know, people who are not like them, others, and or they have accepted and say, well, they're contributing or they just say, look, you know, I couldn't care less. Okay, so I just want to get that assessment from you. What is happening in that landscape? And because the violence continues, race riots continue, uh, political discourse on racism continues. And so how do we explain these, whether it's a contradiction or whether it's an anomaly? I do, I'm just trying to ask myself. And you know, and there are various spaces where non sort of whites are holding good positions. So I'm wondering to what extent they represent the interests of the general people and people who are of that um, ethnicity. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank Hi. you for thank you for a really interesting question. I, I think all those things are happening at the same time. And it's possible for all those things to happen at the same time, where you know, uh, for me the, the the profound reality is that, you know, at the same time as Britain leaves Europe essentially because of freedom of movement, it's still having to import large numbers of migrants for labor. Um, so last year, the, the numbers were higher than they've ever been at over 600,000 who come in. So, you know, people hate that happening, but at the same time, the reality is that the labor is needed. So the two things happen at the same time. Uh, politicians, who represent big business are busily bringing in that labor because on the whole it's cheap. And then at the same time, they demonize that labor because they know they can win elections through the demonization of, uh, of um, you know, foreigners. So the, the, the contradictions are there and the two things happen kind of simultaneously and, and it, it, it is what it is. And what we have to do is to look at who are making the policies and and not necessarily play the games of representation. Um, you know, I think the African Americans have this phrase that not all uh, skin folk are kin folk, um, um, but uh, focus on what the policies are, not who is, you know, pretending to do it. Um, the Africans have a better proverb that uh, the the forest kept thinking that the ax was a friend because um, the, the ax handle was wood, you know, um, until they all came down. So, you know, let's focus on the policies uh, and who is giving them and, and different politicians for advantage will, will play the games that they want to play. Uh, and sometimes those are people um, who look like us and, and they have always been people who look like us who, who colluded with, you know, the slave traders who colluded, colluded with imperialism. They're always there, but let's focus on what it is, the kind of world that we think we want to create that is progressive and, and keep our eyes on, on that prize, as the African-Americans say. Um, the other thing I, I would say, just in terms of understanding that moment of complexity is that, you know, we are, we are at the end of an empire. Um, uh, or several empires that, that have been disintegrating over the last 80, 90, certainly since the Second World, sorry, the First World War, the Ottoman Empire went, the Austro-Hungarian Empire went, um, and the French has gone, the British have gone. So in, in these huge disintegrations, um, lots of very paradoxically thing, paradoxical things are happening. Um, and you'll see, you know, it's hard sometimes to understand, 
you know, what exactly is going on as these empires disintegrate. At the end of the British Empire, when, or the beginning of the end of the British Empire, when India had gone in 1947, the reasons that people come in on the empire wind rush is that Britain passes an immigration act in 1948 that offers citizenship to probably hundreds of millions of people around the world because it saw this as a way of keeping people in the empire on side because it didn't want to lose them like it had lost with uh, with India or to see them drift away. Um, and since 48 and that immigration act, everything that we see happening in terms of um, immigration legislation in the UK is the UK walking itself back from that moment of hubris to trying to discover what a normal country looks like that is not an empire. Remember, an empire is a multinational entity, cosmopolitan that incorporates different people, different ideas and everything else. And, and Britain is slowly trying to now say, okay, at the beginning of this empire, there was a small country called England. What is it? What is England? And, and that's what it's been trying to discover. And inside of that, um, there's a piece that I, I have in the book at the end where we, we talk about the things that it, it is going through in trying to discover um, that England at the beginning of the empire. And that means that it's looking at its relationships with other parts of the United Kingdom, the Scots, who actually want wanted out. So there's a strong independence movement in Scotland. The Welsh want devolution. The Irish want Northern Ireland back. And, and all of this is going on in, in, in that process of the disintegration of empire. And England, which was at the core of that empire, described discovering who it is. And we, as part of the relationship over the last 400 years, have come back and we've be become involved in that conversation. And, and some of us, um, as you can see with some of the leadership, don't always behave well. <laughs> Who are, who are passing even more stringent uh, immigration laws and trying to dump people in Rwanda, etc. Yeah. Onikashi, thank you so much. Uh, some really important points you make there. I'm going to go to Nunu, because I think Nunu is dying to come in to share some of her own reflections as well. So I'm just going to call on you, Nunu, if that's okay, to jump in. Thank you, Stella. <laughs> Can I say to Raj, please buy the book? <laughs> <laughs> I will. Actually, I will, because I'm partly West Indian from, the, uh, okay. from Dominica, and partly because I've gone through the experience, not myself, of course, my relatives, the, who were part of this wind rush. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, one thing, Stella, with your permission, just one, what happens to the kids that they left behind? You know, when parents came, they came to England, they said, okay, we're going to make money, we'll send money home, and then we will probably, you know, call them. I mean, that, that must be, I don't know who has done any study on, because some were called, some joined their parents, others couldn't, and what they were receiving were gifts. So their parents were like gifts, a barrel of something you know, food going there or clothes yeah. going there. Mm. I, I don't know if there are any studies on what actually happened. Uh, some were fine, others than when they met racism and in a new country and so total mess. Uh, but I don't know if there are any studies, but excellent, fascinating book. I will recommend others as well. My, thank you, Raj. My, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You sorry, much. sorry, sorry Nunu. Yeah, sorry. Yes, Nunu, please, please do jump in. Please jump in. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stella for expertly guiding this, um, the conversations, the introduction, um, and thank you to, for ICMC for putting this, um, uh, this program together, because it's something that I, as soon as I saw it, I, I sent a, an email to Colin to say thank you to you and to Stella. So I'm really glad to have been here. My perception or expectation has been completely reframed because, um, well, let me just stay at the beginning. I will definitely buy the book because this isn't a single story about a single moment in history, which is what my expectation was when I came into the space about the Windrush, the particular history of the people. 
as you have said um, expertly so far, it weaves, you know, across regions and history and, um, you know, continents. So it's it's very much um, the story of Black migration, um, which cannot be limited to a single space. Um, and you've gone back and forth in, in mentioning both authors and uh, prominent individuals, African-American. So for me, or for many of us, I should say, the first moment we heard about Windrush was in the deportation uh, in 2018. And it just sounded incredulous that people could have come and been um, in England and made their homes and then just summarily deported. <laughs> At least that's how it was heard, is mm. uh, this entire, not attempt, but total denial um, and erasure of their presence, which, um, as you have said repeatedly, you know, kind of relates to the history of the United States and erasure of Black presence, which has continued from the beginning to say, we were not just here, we are here, we continue to, to be here to, and we need to be seen and to be heard and, and that those resistance continue, in, not just in the Black Lives Matter, but in many forms. But um, I just wanted to make a couple of points. One, you know, it's been repeat. It's been mentioned a couple of times that the president, the the election of a leader of South Asian descent, somehow is going to create a new trajectory of shift of identity in the UK and elsewhere. And what does that mean? And what does the project? Because we've had these conversations when Barack Obama came into office. Um, and the expectation that we won, <laughs> we did it, you know, we're present, we're visible now, and let's move on, only to have seen this unleashing of white supremacist agenda, like we've never seen it before. So uh, I wish this conversation, this program was at least three hours. <laughs> so much you have touched on, I would love to hear. And I know I'm going to regret after I read the book. I wish I had asked him this and that question, but I'll stop here and let you uh, reflect on what I've said. Well, well thank you, Nudu. I mean, in the African-American con context, I mean, what, one of the things putting together the book was just to realize how many of these things repeat uh, over the years. So Mary Prince's experience, we can see it repeated now. Um, there have been two occasions when a presence of Black uh, and or African descended people in the UK have led to immigration panics and people wanted wanting to deport um, those African American, uh, sorry, people of African descent from the UK. The first was under the first Queen Elizabeth, where she actually releases an edict, edict back in the in the 1500s, um, to saying that there were too many black and moors in her realm and, and they should be got rid of so it's not nothing is ever new uh, the second time was when uh, in the 1890s uh, uh, you know a group of african americans who had fought on the side of the british during the uh, the war for independence uh, were then taken back to the uk and then abandoned and and no money, nothing, they're on the streets of London hustling uh, and eventually they are identified as a menace. And, and so there's a, they get deported to settle the, the new settlement in Freetown in Sierra Leone, where you know, um, the, the British Navy was um, capturing um, slave, enslaved uh, ships that were trafficking Africans and then dip, leaving them in Freetown. So this group were then set over there to establish the colony. So we 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 know that this stuff is happens again and again and again. Uh, and with Obama, for instance, we know that after the Civil War, um, you had that moment of uh, you know emancipation and reconstruction. Um, five, <coughs> sorry, um, five acres and a meal. Or, or is it four acres and a mule? And, you know, that was going to empower the ex-enslaved. And then very quickly, you know, the North abandons all the African-Americans in the South to, um, and there's this incredibly vicious um, uh, sort of uh, pushback and they're abandoned to Jim Crow. Uh, and they're basically 
you know, second class citizens again onto the 1950s. So every time there's progress, as with the Civil War, there's a backlash. Uh, and so when Obama was elected, I was expecting the Tea Party. It was no surprise because it was going to come. And in the in the current uh, dispensation, it came as the Tea Party before it came as the Klan and um, and the Black Code. So we we, sh we should understand. And, you know, what I'm trying to do with the book is to say, look, these things, you, there's an economic system, there's a, an ideological system, there's a system of supremacy that, you know, if we're going to tackle it, it, it has very deep roots. Um, and we have to understand how we go about tackling that and making the arguments that we make for people to be able to move um, as freely as everybody else moves uh, in these spaces that we all helped build and construct um you know the north american space it, it is you know the land is belong to the native americans the african labor indian labor chinese labor has played a huge role alongside european you know um efforts in constructing that space and it should we should all be able to sit down and and argue passionately for what happens in that space as well so, so yes, I agree with you that you know we should never. We when there's progress, we should all, always expect the the that uh, the pushback is going to come, and it will come with ferocity as it did in the American South. You you only have to read what happened after Reconstruction in the American South. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nunu. Thanks for that question. And thanks, Unikachi, for the response. Um, can I just check with colleagues at ICMC? Uh, Ilana, do we have time for one more? I see that there was a question in the chat from uh, Amadou Bokassam, but just wanted to check if we have time for that. We're a bit over time, but if anyone wants to stay and continue asking questions, then please feel free. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question. So, Yes, so I, I think actually, I mean, it's a question which is in the in the chat really, and maybe we can maybe we can wrap up from there. But it's really is a question about uh, so Amadou talks about the experience in in Spain uh, and Spain being one of the last countries to abolish slave trade. Now um, he asks, um, what what must we all do um, as the diaspora, I guess, to put to put this agenda or to keep this agenda? sort of going um, is his main question. Well, I think one of the important things is that we, we language is important in all of this and we, we, we can't talk about a trade in, in slaves. I mean, it's, the, it, it was human trafficking, so let's call it what it was. Um, and people argue that it was legal at the time. There's never been any jurisdiction where kidnap was legal, where and every time the legality of it was tested in the in Europe, it was thrown out because it was illegal and, and it just operated in the kind of gray zone that, um, you know, that place in Cuba, what's it called, um, the Guantanamo operates, where no one's sure, as Mary Prince did when she comes to, to London, no one's sure about the status because there are these kind of gray zones where things that are illegal operate and are accepted as being legal. So it, trafficking, call, let's call it what it was. It was kidnapping, trafficking, and language is important. Um, and then, yes, all these different locations that were involved um, in, in the process of the construction of the um, Euro-Atlantic order, yeah, there were different locations. So Spain played an important role, Portugal, the Netherlands, the Netherlands recently has come out to, to apologize, the King and the Prime Minister for their involvement in this. So that process of accepting accountability for what happens is really important. Whether that leads to better migration policies or not, who knows? But you know, all these things are, as I said, are happening at the same time and, and, and they're contradictory uh, pressures that are going on. I think somebody asked in the chat room about, you know, you, you know, would Rishi have won an election as prime minister? Probably not. He was selected. Um, and the Conservative Party 
selected him for a reason. They tried to do that amongst the MPs initially. Um, and then it went to the members and the members selected uh, Liz Truss, uh, who was a, a bit of a disaster. And then it came back to the party and they selected him this time and they made sure, this is what we know, that it didn't go back to the members for a decision. So it was a done job in parliament um, for the new leader. Now, why would they have gone to that extent to accept, you know, to select Rishi? So my sense is that in this restructuring that's happening um, globally, that, you know, Rishi might be the bright price to India um, to get India on side because some of those calculations are happening. So, you know, that's just my cynical um, <laughs> kind of reading of this. But, you know, we wouldn't, we couldn't put all our countries uh, beyond some of these calculations. Um, there are obviously huge forces that are gathering with the BRICS and, if if you if I were you know a leader in the UK and I saw that as a threat, then you know I would do what was necessary uh, to you know make offers to important elements of the BRICS so that you remove their effectiveness. So yeah, so all of these stuff is in the mix. Um, just to end, I would just say um, to for all of us that it, it's both an exciting moment. Um, because it's still we're still part of the unraveling of empire, and we can make arguments. We can continue to make the challenges for progressive policies that you know that empower and humanize people, and we push back against those who want to continue to exploit. It took well before forty years. Uh, sorry, twenty over twenty years to get the abolition bill. In place and uh, for for the um, for the trafficking, and then another you know nearly thirty years um, for the institution of slavery, um, and each time he was resisted by the planters who were in parliament, and the planters had an interest in free labour, so that there will always be planters. Yeah. Absolutely. Olinkashi, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you. That was really, really interesting. I think everyone has taken something away from it. I believe people are going to go away and purchase the book. Uh, I think Ilana had shared a link as well, but do follow up with ICMC uh, for the link in terms of how to purchase the book. Uh, and if I may, seeing as I, I am the moderator, for those of you who are based in London, if you are, we are continuing this conversation this Friday at SOAS. Feel free to get in touch with me and I'll share the information with you. But this conversation continues right here in London, uh, physical space uh, on Friday. Um, but other than that, I think just to say a big thank you really to Onikachi uh, for this conversation, for making the time, for sharing with us his, um, his thoughts, uh, you know, his knowledge as well. Uh, which has been absolutely brilliant. I think there's so much more to discuss just based on this book. And I'm looking forward to uh, the next book tours to come <laughs> around this. Uh, and also to say a big thank you to ICMC as well, Ilana and Umu and Colin uh, for, uh, you know, for bringing this to, to everyone else and for organizing this as well. Thank you very much and hope to see you again soon at some other event. <laughs>